Uh, we begin here a new audio series of short talks from the Pustinia. Most of these will be spiritual reflections from Angie Mann, one of our original OJW elders, that have already been published in our Alongsider, that is our OJW Associates newsletters. We've always been blessed by the gentle, caring and thoughtful prayer ministry of Angie, who has in recent years been able to define herself and her ministry in this way as a contribution to the whole that is OJW. The idea of a Pustinia has a long and meaningful association with a ministry of prayer and in particular a life devoted to contemplative prayer. It's a vital part of the tradition and ministry in the Orthodox Church in Russia. And the name Pustinia comes from a Russian word meaning desert. In practice, it is a ministry set aside for prayer and also the actual building as well, a Pustinia, occupied by a de dedicated resident, the Pustinik. It can also be part of a personal calling to grow in the spiritual life. In the tradition of the Western Church, the um, nearest equivalent is Hermitage, a place occupied by a man or woman dedicated for a time to a largely solitary life of prayer. One of the particular blessings of the Orthodox Pustinia tradition in the Eastern Church is that despite being located in a typically secluded and separated location, it was still understood that the occupant is a vital part of the local worshipping community. That fellowship has the reassurance that their resident Pustinik is always there, both as a prayerful presence, but also, if required, a welcoming presence who would listen and offer prayers for visitors and probably, like us, put the kettle on. So, why do we need a Pustinia and what does a Pustinic do? The ministry is founded on intercession through the practice of contemplative prayer using devotion to scripture and long periods of silence. It's about being set aside and being devoted to and above all waiting on and listening to God. The essential spiritual characteristic is an open heart and a listening soul. It might seem like a contradiction to shut yourself away from the world in order to be able to serve and care for others' needs in intercessory prayer. It's one of the fundamental Christian paradoxes and can be understood through a process of spiritual reflection, usually over a long period of time. And in that reflection comes the understanding and comes the answer. And that journey is the very heart of what contemplative prayer is actually all about. I would offer six interrelated recommended preliminary understandings for the practice of contemplative prayer for your reflection as you approach this. Each of them offers the possibility for exploration and spiritual growth. Both in your personal devotions or as part of a fellowship group. This is not intended to be a definitive list, as so much more always is more to learn, but rather part of the ongoing process of sharing cumulative experience of what might be helpful for all of our personal journeys towards God in prayer. Wherever we are on that path, we are all pilgrims on that journey. So my six points. The first point. 
Prayer can never be separated from everyday life. They're one and the same. The value of any part of our life's work is found not in the nature of the work itself, but rather in the heavenly love which motivates us to respond to Father God in whatever he calls us to do and wherever he calls us to do it. Secondly, only the Holy Spirit can teach us how to pray. We are, of course, very familiar with this idea and know this because it's a foundation of what all of the church teaches. Therefore, we all experience this message, but we can so easily pay it less attention than we should. Contemplative prayer requires that we learn and experience the promptings of the Spirit afresh each and every day. I would offer the possibility by way of a direction towards an answer that this part of our relationship with God is better sought by waiting rather than by effort or any specific learnt method. The only common factor is the personal reality of the cumulative experience of our own life's pilgrimage towards God. At any one point in time, we are who we are. Third point, learn technique must always be subordinate to encounter with the living God. There is, for example, no one technique that we can brand as an OJW method that we have to learn or sign up to to become part of this. There's no requirement to be on message which needs moderating or even testing in any way. We share together and choose to come together and identify with each other in fellowship because that is where God has placed us, each of us at this time. We choose to belong together as equals in the sight of God. Fourthly, prayer is at heart an offering. If we are able to experience prayer quite easily in this way, one very important consequence which will bless us is that we should be relieved of any anxiety to succeed, to make a success of prayer, to get it right. This, of course, will then save us from discouragement. And I would suggest that discouragement is perhaps the single most important reason while we do not persevere in prayer. Fifthly, prayer exists and prayer prospers in the context of proclamation. We're now very familiar with this one through Mike's teaching on the kingdom. I suppose this may be the closest we might need to get to anything that looks like an OJW method but actually, it's a universal truth, and it's at heart the profoundly human as well as spiritual need to be fed and nurtured by the shared truth of the gospel kingdom message in the scriptures. And my last point, each person's experience is unique and special and of equal importance in the kingdom. It is a personal spiritual journey, which others can share from time to time and we with them along the way. We can thus learn from and encourage each other. So, how does all of this relate in practice to the ministry of OJW? Well, in one very important sense, we can all do this and benefit from it. It's not an elitist activity, but of course some do have a special calling. Most aspects of this contemplative ministry mirror the aspirations of OJW and its thinking and its theology. And you can see that especially with the International Prayer Project, which is at its heart about our working relationship with God. 
please go to our website for more information on this. And then perhaps from my own experience in our local church. A few years ago we've been exploring some of these thoughts and concepts as part of our journey of prayer in a weekly online Zoom-based prayer group session. This was actually set up in the first place to meet a very specific practical need during the first pandemic lockdown when we were not able to meet together for prayer and yet there was still we saw a vital need for regular parish intercessions. Well every meeting began with proclamation through the reading of a Bible passage and then uh, a meditation and um, a silence. And then within that silence we bring the needs of others by simply naming them. Their needs are offered before God's mercy in what is a prayerful holy space. By the way, this time became for our group praying together a regular, precious, peaceful place for us to be amongst all of the busyness of church life. So Pustinia, well we need to remember that the original Pustinia traditions arose from a need to have a dedicated ministry for a person in the fellowship or community in order to serve that community. Everyone needs and benefits from the spiritual prayerful ministry of an accessible Pustinia in their lives and maybe especially in their own fellowships. In OGW we are blessed to be able to say that Mike, though he might not seem always to talk about it in these terms, has always done this as the fundamental basis for his ministry, which has always been about sharing with us the fruits of his own deep, deep prayerful relationship with God. And long may that continue. So I invite you now in this series to follow Angie on her Pustinia journey and to be blessed. <laughs> 